Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another Ask Ian Q&A video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and our question today comes from Thunderchild on Patreon, and they ask, how would you see a modern major nation, US, Russia, China, etc., simplify their small arms in a large war scenario, like a World War III, or going back a little bit, Cold War gone hot? Um, you've mentioned in the past how most nations in these sorts of wars have to end up simplifying to meet demand, so why not just start that way? Well, let's start with that second part of the question. There are really good reasons not to start with a simplified rifle, and they basically come down to production time. So the biggest, ultimately the biggest reason that, that countries come up with the sort of last-ditch simplified rifle is because they get into a situation where the warfare they are in the middle of is consuming more rifles than they can make. And you like wake up and realize, oh wow, I need a hundred thousand more rifles by next weekend, or else we're going to have big parts of the army that don't have guns. That's a big problem. So how do we go about doing this? Well, we need to reduce the production time. Now, in peacetime, when new weapon systems are typically being adopted, you don't have that time pressure. If you're introducing a new rifle, it doesn't really matter if it takes six months to roll it out to the whole force, or five years to roll it out, as long as war doesn't start during that time. But it makes a lot more sense to have all the bells and whistles, and nice features, and do the guns right, especially if you have um, quality control issues that will, if done properly, will ensure a longer lifespan on the guns, will ensure better parts compatibility so you don't have logistical problems repairing uh, guns when they do eventually start to wear out. All of those things are much more important than how fast can we crank out every rifle during peacetime. And a lot of these guns, you know, how many countries have gotten themselves into this sort of all-out war for survival at any given time? It's not that many. The chances are much greater that the, the rifles you produce that are sufficient to arm your basic standing peacetime army are going to be sufficient, and you're not going to need to make an extra two million of them to equip, you know, to, to round up every able-bodied male in the country and equip them as a conscript uh, to throw into a human wave attack. So, so that's why we don't do simplified rifles to begin with. Now, when we do, let's consider what, what actually makes sense to simplify on a rifle. It's going to be things that are going to allow you to produce guns faster. In some cases it may be about strategic materials. If you're short on some particular material, it makes sense to use less of it if you can. But a lot of this comes down to machine time, because machine time is one of those set things where if we want to make more guns, we either have to come up with a whole bunch more milling machines. Today that would be CNC machines, and if you're having a hard time producing rifles because it's wartime, you're probably going to have a hard time importing them. You're probably not going to have an easy access to some big, you know, strategic level stash of CNC machines that you can put into operation. You're probably already doing that, or using them for something else that's even more important than rifles. And so that leaves us with, let's reduce the machine time required to make the thing. So if we were uh, I want to look at the M16 platform today, and, and we can look at just an amalgam of M16s from Cold War to present day. So Cold War pattern, one of the things that would definitely happen would be a simplification of the sights. When the M16A2 was adopted, the sights are much more of a, a fine adjustable target style competition sight. That would go out the window. I think you would see a reversion back to A1 style of sights, because they use fewer parts, they're simpler, they're easier. Um, in theory, you could simplify it to just a very like a basic fixed sight instead of even including any elevation adjustment. We see the Japanese doing that on the Arasaka in World War II. They went through a series of reductions in complexity of Type 99 rear sights. Of course, they start with all the fancy features, the the fold down anti aircraft wings, uh, and also an adjustable ladder out to you know, 2,000 meters. By the end of the war, it was just a fixed aperture. Um, if demand was high enough, I could see an AR with just a single plane fixed aperture in that carry handle for an iron sight. But that would be a fairly extreme degradation of the rifle. In modern terms, our choke point, frankly, I suspect the optics production would be more of a choke point than the rifle production, so we would probably see a reversion back to um, iron sights instead of issuing optics to everybody. That might require developing a simplified standard iron sight 
especially rear iron sight to clip onto a Picatinny upper, uh, Picatinny rail upper. So something like that would probably be developed. Some of this stuff would probably end up being polymer. If you want to reduce machine time, there's almost no better option than to transition from using metal to using polymer. A polymer mold can pop out a basically complete part really, really fast. Um, in fact, I think one of the fascinating options for especially a, a modern uh, last-ditch emergency production rifle would be a monolithic polymer receiver, like a KP-15. The, the cycle time on, well, the cycle time on KE Arms mold for that KP-15 is 65 seconds per receiver to put in the, the raw material, close the mold, heat the polymer, blow it in, set the mold, open it up, pull the part out. That's a 65 second turnaround. And so you can put out a tremendous number of receivers that way compared to milled forgings. Think about the time that it takes. Frankly, you could come close to printing, well not printing, you could come close to molding a polymer lower receiver faster than you could actually really set up a, uh, aluminum forgings in the CNC to finish machine them. M not even talking about the machine time itself, just the setup time is going to is going to be within an order of magnitude of the total production time on that KP-15 style mold. You're also, of course, cutting out like four extra parts by doing that. You no longer have a separate buffer tube, you no longer have a separate castle nut, separate pistol grip, pistol grip screw, pistol grip nut. Um, all of these pieces can just go away. And that's a great way to increase turnaround time and speed up production. Um, barrel profile would be an interesting thing to watch. I think there are some time, there are some places on various patterns of M16 where there are barrel profile features that aren't necessary, like the M4 uh, carbine government profile barrel, where it's got a cut in it specifically for attachment of under barrel grenade launchers, the M203s. Well, if we're in emergency mass production of M4 carbines, do we really need to have that cut? That's that's one extra operation we can speed up and simplify by getting rid of it, and I think there would be a good reason to get rid of that cut. Again, one of those things that doesn't make sense to do in peacetime, when your time horizon doesn't really make much difference, and the dollar cost is pretty minimal, but it could make a difference in emergency all-out war production. Um, let's see, what else? There are a couple other things I had in mind there. Oh, right. I think that would go away really fast. Even if you don't go to a, a single monolithic polymer lower, the idea of having an adjustable length stock is a peacetime luxury. Uh, yeah, it's handy. Uh, this of course is the old two position one today, they're four, six even. In wartime, that's again extra parts. The folding, the collapsing stock would go away, you would end up instead with a fixed length stock. Pick whatever length is best. If you don't, I think the A1 length is pretty great. If you think that's too long because of armor, and if you're actually still issuing every soldier armor, fine, cut it down another inch or something. Just they would pick one and they would use it because again, it saves parts and it saves time on the production, and that's what's important for this sort of thing. Um, oh. And one more that comes to mind is the burst feature. So some, you know, the, the US military has vacillated around with and without the burst feature on uh, ARs, on M16s. I think in a wartime production those would go away. You, the, the burst mechanism is relatively complex, it adds a bunch more parts to the fire control system, and you don't need it. Like, again, it's a peacetime luxury to have. It simplifies training because, well, it makes people think they don't really need to train on full auto. Um, get rid of that and go to just safe semi full, another pretty straightforward obvious uh, simplification. So hopefully that gives you, th like those are the ideas that come to my mind of how we would see an iterated M16 in the, in the same vein of what we see with uh, Arasaka's simplifying over the course of World War II, of Gewehr 98's, or Carabiner 98's simplifying over the course of World War II. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. This was a fun one to think about and hypothesize on. If you would like to have your own question answered in a video format like this, sign up over at Patreon or Utreon to help directly support Forgotten Weapons. And I put a request there on both of those platforms each month for Q&A questions to do videos on. Thanks for watching.